Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah has a beautiful word. word. He says, ما عبد العابدون بشيء أفضل بتركهم ما نهى الله عنه. He said, the best thing a worshipper can do concerning his servitude to Allah is avoid what Allah prohibited for him. That's the best thing you can do as a slave of Allah Azza wa Jal, to avoid the haram and to avoid the sins. And listen to what Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu says. He says, رد دانق مما يكره الله أحب إلى الله من خمسمائة حجة. He said to return a danik. A danik is sixths of a dirham, meaning 0.65 grams of gold. Like a little bit of gold, less than a gram. To return less than a gram of gold, of haram wealth, is better than doing 500 voluntary hajj. Then the 500 voluntary hajj is recommended. But this is haram. It is obligatory to get rid of the haram. For this is better than this. Where from those who are under the shade of Allah Azza wa Jal on the day of judgment, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says one of the categories is a man who was approached by a woman. ذات منصب وجمال Not any kind of woman. A woman who has status. She has a reputation. She is known in the community. And on top of this, she is pretty. A beautiful looking girl. So this man was approached by such a woman. And he said to her, Inni Allah Azzawajal puts him under his shade. And this is also true for a woman. If she was approached by a man, and he asked her for zina, and she said to him, I fear Allah, she's included in the hadith. But the hadith was worded with a man because it more, mostly, most likely happens with men. ذَاتُ مَنْصِبٍ وَجَمَالٍ Right? Like Yusuf alayhi salam. He was approached by a woman of great caliber and status. And she was good looking as well. Because that's much more difficult to reject. Because when she's of great status, and you don't do what she says, she might blackmail you. So you might fall into the sin and say, you know what, I've just got to keep her shut, so I need to do what I need to do. That type of woman to say, inni Allah and go away, has incredible reward under the shade of Allah Azza wa Jal. The idea is, can you see and understand now how important it is for a believer to avoid sins? The one who keeps away from major sins and fights himself against it, is better than the one who engages in Nawafil Umar ibn Abdul Aziz radiallahu anhu. He said, لَيْسَ التَّقْوَى صِيَامُ النَّهَارِ وَلَا قِيَامُ اللَّيْلِ إِنَّمَا التَّقْوَى أَدَاءُ مَفْتَرَضَ اللَّهُ وَتَرْكُ مَا حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ Umar ibn Abdul Aziz rahimahu Allah radiallahu anhu. He defined what piety is. He said piety is not to pray the, all the nights and fast the days. Anyone can do this. He said true piety you know, that's a part of piety. True piety is to do what Allah commands and to keep away from what Allah Azza wa Jal forbid. That's the true piety. Ulama al usul al ulama of fiqh, when they discussed the word haram and they defined it in terms of its consequence, they said, ma yuthabu tarikuhu wa yu'aqab fa'iluhu. The sin, al haram is. If you avoid it, you earn reward. And if you commit it, you earn sins. See that? Just by avoiding the haram, you are being rewarded. Why? Because we said you need patience to avoid the haram, and that patience you're getting rewarded for it. Fine. Let's speak about these 10 reasons, now that we have understood the seriousness of this topic. My brothers and sisters in Islam, you focus and you pay attention. My job is to explain it as easy as I can and as simple as I can. You're going to count insha'Allah. The more you have of these ways, the better for you and the more protection. If you have one of these 10, Alhamdulillah, start working on attaining the others. The less you have, the less protection you have from sins. The more you have, the more protection. Let's start bi ibnillahi ta'ala. Number one. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he said, 
علم العبد بقبحها وردالتها ودنائها نمبر وان is for the servant to know and acknowledge and realize that sins are repulsive abhorrent despicable disgusting and they are filthy in nature that's the first thing you should realize that sins are disgusting Allah Azza wa Jal he only forbids sins because they are disgusting and filthy and nasty and when you are aware of this fact this becomes a reason for why a person remains patient in avoiding sins altogether I tell you something the normal human being whose fitrah is still intact his natural disposition hasn't been deviated and it hasn't changed a normal human being runs away from anything that is disgusting you know that if you smell something disgusting what happens we can see the reaction in your face and you run away if you taste something disgusting and bad you spit it out you vomit it and you never touch it ever again if you see something disgusting once you walk into a public toilet and you saw urine all over the toilet the smell the look you look you run out you'll hold it and you'll run out of there and you won't even go in that's the natural human being he's disgusted and he runs away from filth and dirt this is the normal human being the normal human being loves what's good he comes to that which is good to that which is pleasant and he keeps away from that which is filthy this is why when Allah Azza wa Jal referred to sins in the Quran look at the kind of words he used Al-Munkar detested condemned matters Al-Dhamb Al-Dhamb is a sin it comes from the word Dhanab which is the tail of an animal imagine being served the tail of an animal would you eat it? That's what it's called. That's what a sin is, a thump. Al-Khaba'ith. Look at the word, Al-Khaba'ith. How it comes out, there's, there's like heaviness to it. Khaba'ith means disgusting, filthy, evil matters. Al-Fawahish. Look at the word. Min al-Fuhsh. Horrible, evil, immoralities, vulgarities, shamelessness. Al-Munkar, and so on. These are the words used for sins. And there is a very important principle to understand here, and that is that Allah Azza wa Jal never forbids anything upon us except that it is harmful, damaging, and destructive to us, to our bodies and to our souls. If someone asks, why is this haram? Why is this a sin? Automatically the answer is because it's harmful. It's harmful to the heart, to the body, it's harmful to society, it's harmful to your iman, it's harmful to your grave when you enter in the grave, it's harmful for your hereafter, it's harmful for your relationship with Allah. In every aspect you look at a sin, it's harmful in every direction. There is zero goodness in it. Take some examples. We look at alcohol. How many times does the news from time to time, there's a new research that says 0.3 mils, 300 it's 300 mils of alcohol is good for human health. Only two years later, recent study has found that zero alcohol is good for your health. Then the next year, no, actually, one cup a week is good. Then again, no, not all of it is good. And that because these people don't have wahi, so they are confused between it's good, it's not good, and they'll remain like this until the world ends. The believer knows of the harmful nature of alcohol, its destruction to the soul, to the mind, to society, and all of this, and of course it's haram, because of its filth and its disgust and its harms to a person and to everything that is related to this person. You look at drugs, same thing. What goodness is there in drugs? Name one goodness, there's nothing. It is all bad. Addiction, suffering, murders, standovers call it what you want a person loses his mind he doesn't pray he leaves in islam and iman and the lot pork and how disgusting and how harmful is it to a person a riba a riba is harmful look at the oppression it's done they speak about 
This is the recent ninth interest rise. How damaging. What has it done to people's mental health? What has it done to people financially? It's harmful to society, to its people. People commit suicide because of their financial situation as a result of a riba. Everything Allah Azza wa Jal made haram is harmful to the human. Smoking, vaping, shisha, the time you kill, the time you spend, harmful. A zina, AIDS, HIV, genital warts. It's harmful to society, a zina. Kids are abandoned, they are murdered. Here in Australia, abortion is illegal until about six months. Sure, six months, and this is a boy. This is, a, this is an actual, actual child. He's surgically cut up and removed one piece after the other. Abortion leads to the sin of murder. And if it's after six months, you need approval of two doctors and they'll remove him. That's as a result of zina. Homosexuality, anal cancer, that's harmful. Anal cancer, genital warts, HIV, AIDS, HPV, human papillomavirus, hepatitis A, B, C. There is no cure for these matters at all. You'll be on treatment for the rest of your life. Huh? And you know, just like on the smoking packet they have up the top, you know when you buy it, we don't buy it, we don't buy it. But when you see someone buying it or you see it in the store, there's a warning up the top. Bad for your, or it gives lung damage, lung cancer, kidney cancer, and they've got these filthy, disgusting images. And, and I believe that this is the same thing that should be done with every rainbow flag. They should be up the top a human with anal cancer. So that at least people are aware of the harms and the damage that it does to human health. Very simple. So everything Allah Azza wa made haram is harmful. It's disgusting. It's filthy. It's terrible. And I said to you, a human being that is sane and that is normal, he'll see the disgust in these things and he runs away from it. And that's why Allah Azza wa declared them haram because they are harmful. So the intelligent person keeps away from harmful matter, even if he wasn't a believer. And we're just speaking about someone with a mind, an intellectual mind. He's still sane. Even if he was not a believer, a normal human being runs away from that which is filthy. And it was mentioned that some of the Arabs would never drink alcohol. And when they are asked, they would answer saying, how can a sane, sound-minded person intoxicate himself and act like an idiot in the street and like an idiot in his home in front of his family. These are kuffar Arabs that had enough self-respect to keep away from that which would make them look like idiots. But sometimes some matters may be confusing. You might see them as good. There's a sin, but you might not. How is this a sin? I can't see it as being a sin. Actually looks good. But the reality, it is a sin and it's bad and it's harmful. But what has happened is that the shaytan's main role on earth is to decorate the sin. Didn't Allah Azza wa Jal say, وَزَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ أَعْمَالَهُمْ That the shaytan decorates the sin. He makes it look good, but in reality, it is bad. What do you do in those cases when you're confused and you don't know if it's disgusting and it's harmful and it's a sin, you think it's good. That's why you need knowledge. How are you going to avoid something when you don't know what to avoid? So you will need knowledge. Well, shaitan has been doing this trick and this game from day one. Like what he did with Adam alayhi salam in the paradise. Allah azza wa jal forbid upon Adam a tree. He said, do not come next to this tree. A shaitan would whisper to Adam and say to him, Hal adulluka ala shajarat al khuld. Shall I direct you to shajarat al khuld? Look at the beautiful name he gave it. He decorated the sin. He said, this is a tree of eternity. Meaning, come, eat from the tree and you will remain in this paradise forever. If you eat from it, one of two good things could happen. 
You and your wife will either be angels in the paradise. If you're angels, you'll never leave. Or khalidin, you'll be there forever. Khalas, you'll never come out. This is a filthy tree. And he's calling it the eternal tree. The tree that will give you life forever in the paradise. That's what the shaitan does. He decorates the sit. And his trick continues until this very day. Homosexuality is a rainbow. Beautiful colors, deceptive colors, but that's how it's decorated. And love is love. Drugs, they have all these different names to them. Speed, ice, oh, it sounds nice and refreshing. Shaitan has done this. Ecstasy, ecstasy means what? It means happiness. That's what ecstasy means. Alcohol is called spirits. Spirits, yeah, as though if you're down, drink it and your spirit will rise. This is its name. Uh, suicide. Assisted suicide. Now it is... No. Hasant. Suicide. Assisted suicide is available. If you don't want to live, you can go sign a few papers and you die. But... Assisted suicide, they've given it a new name. What's it called? Euthanasia. Voluntary euthanasia. You know what euthanasia means? Who's come across this word? It's a word that originated in the early 17th century from the Greek word euthanos. Eu means well, thanos means death. Euthanasia means a good death. And they call it mercy killing as well. Show what the shaitan has done. He's taken the name and decorated it and presented it to the people. It looks nice. So if the believer doesn't have knowledge, he will be confused about what the sin is and what is haram. As a result, seeking knowledge becomes very important. So that's the first matter. To know that sins are filthy in nature and the normal human being automatically keeps away from that which is filthy. Number one, understood? Shayyid. Number two, in order to avoid sins, one must have hayaun min Allah, shyness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah says, when the servant knows that Allah is looking at him, watching over him, and he sees him and he hears him, he becomes too shy in front of Allah azza wa jal to commit a sin. He becomes too shy. You know, Shyness in Arabic is what? What's the word? Al-haya. Al-haya comes from the word hay. Hay means alive. The one who has shyness in his heart, his heart is alive. The one who is not shy, his heart is dead. Having shyness of Allah will most definitely allow you to control yourself when it comes to a sin. I tell you something, my brothers and sisters in Islam. Today, no one will dare to commit a sin in front of his father or his mother or his husband or his wife or even in front of a young child. Why? Because he's shy. Because he knows he is doing something dirty and filthy. And I don't want people to see me in this state. But subhanAllah, <laughs> were people going to judge you on the day of judgment? Why were you shy of them? and not shy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He is your Lord and you will stand in front of Him answering for what you did. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he defined the sin, he said, وَكَرِهْتَ أَنْ يَطَّلِعَ عَلَيْهِ النَّاسِ That's how some, if you're, if you're confused about what a sin is, it's the things that you dislike people seeing you do. That's a sin. Subhanallah today, if someone is in a room alone, and he hears the squeaking of a door. He's immediate to drop the haram and fix himself up. And then when he realizes it was the wind that played with the door, he's relieved. Alhamdulillah, it wasn't my child or my wife. Or... Yani, how can this be the state of a believer? The question is, wasn't Allah seeing you all this time? See, I give you a solution, my brothers and sisters in Islam. Whenever you approach to commit a sin, there is most definitely and always, and you'll agree with me, a noise in your head that is telling you Allah is watching. 
Most definitely. If you don't have that, then you're not a believer. Every believer believes that Allah sees him. No one is in denial of this fact. And this type of feeling and noise that's in your mind and body and soul at the time when approaching a sin, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam refers to it in the hadith as Wa'idullahi fi qalbi kulli mu'min. It is the warner of Allah that exists in the heart of every believer. That's Allah's warning in your heart. That's how the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam described that feeling. I tell you something. When you approach to commit a sin, what you need to do, do not silence and suppress this noise and feeling. Rather, take advantage of it and bring it aloud to your body and onto your tongue. Take advantage. When you approach a sin, say, Allah watches over me. Say it aloud. Don't bury it. Say it aloud right then and there. It doesn't, doesn't, doesn't gonna cost you anything. Just say, Allah can see me. Allah said in the Quran, Alam ya'lam bi anna Allah yara? Doesn't he know and isn't he aware that Allah Azza wa Jal can see? At that moment, answer Allah. Say, yes. I know that you can see me. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, "Yastaghfuna min al-nas wa la yastaghfuna min Allah." They hide away from Allah and they do, they hide away from people and they do not hide away from Allah. Wa huwa ma'hum, and He is with them. He can see them and fully aware of what they do. So turn to yourself and say, "Allah, Allah, I know that you can see me and I'm aware of the fact that you can see me." Say it loud. Yusuf alayhi salam, when the woman approached him and said, Hey Talak, she locked the doors, she shut them, she sealed them tightly, and she said to him, I'm prepared for you. Hey Talak, Allahu Akbar. Imagine that. Well, what's more than this as a fitna? A beautiful looking pretty woman that is young, and she's the wife of the king of Egypt. So this is a lady of status. You have to listen to her, otherwise, she'll get you in serious trouble. Yusuf alayhi salam, a young beautiful man that was given the beauty of all of creation. Half of creation. At that moment he said, Ma'ad Allah. He screamed the word Allah. At that moment when you approach the sin, say the word Allah. Ma'ad Allah. Meaning I seek refuge in Allah. I seek Allah's protection from this evil that is in front of me right now. Yaqi, aren't you shy of Allah Azza wa Jal? Aren't you shy that you will disobey Allah Azza wa Jal with a blessing that He has given you? When you sin with your eyes, the eyes was a blessing. It deserved gratitude, not ingratitude and disobey Allah with it. When you sin with your hands, these were a blessing. You were supposed to make shukr and say Alhamdulillah, instead you used them for a sin. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, وَلَا يَثْقُلُ مَعَسْمِ اللَّهِ شَيْءٍ Nothing outweighs the name of Allah. What does that mean? It means at the moment when you are most tempted and you continue to say, مَعَاذَ اللَّهِ And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, the name of Allah outweighs everything. Meaning if your desire is on one side of the scale, and Allah's mention is on the other side of the scale, what happens to your desire? It goes away. It cannot weigh with the name of Allah. So very soon, you will find that your heart overcomes the desire and overcomes the sin. Because it's impossible. If you say Allah, ma'ad Allah, with a firm heart, with honesty and certainty and sincerity, the thing that you're comparing it with and you're fighting, using it to fight, is the desire, the sin. That'll go. It'll evaporate. All of a sudden, you'll find yourself, Alhamdulillah, I overcame the sin. After that happens, and you find that Allah is like an ice that has dropped on fire, and the fire of the sin and the lust begins to extinguish and turn off, straight away get up and move from that place. Get up, hurry up, because this is where the shaitan came to you and he will come again. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once, when he was with the companions, they slept at night and they did not wake up until the sun had risen. Meaning what? 
they missed Salat al-Fajr. Naam, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the companions missed Salat al-Fajr. The narration is in Sahih al-Bukhari. When the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam got up and they wanted to pray Salat al-Fajr, he said to the companions, move from here because this is a place asabatkum fihi ghaflah. This is a place in which heedlessness got the better of us. This is a place that we sinned in. So let's move from here. And he moved them and then he prayed somewhere else. Even though, if you miss the prayer, you're supposed to pray it as soon as you remember it. It's urgent, but moving away is more urgent so that you don't get tempted to do the sin again. And even if you looked at the story of Yusuf alayhi salam to continue it, right, he did say, Ma'ad Allah, I seek Allah's protection. But then you know what he did? He didn't just stand there looking at him. Allah said, الباب, They rushed to the door. He said, Ma'ad Allah, and he ran to the door. As soon as he got to the door, you know what happened? What happened? الباب, her husband was at the door. He opened the door. You know what that means? Finally, relief came. Plus, he's not, that temptation of the sin is gone. Oh, there's, someone's there. How much? How much time between the desire, the temptation, and relief? It's the matter of getting up and moving. That's it. It's gone. Get up. Call a friend. Go somewhere. And respect your weakness. Respect your weakness. The human being is weak. He can fall into the sin once again. You know, when a person comes out from surgery, where do they take him? His bed rolls into the ICU, yeah? The intensive care unit. When you're in the intensive care unit, why is it called intensive care? Because there are nurses 24-7 around you. They don't leave you. So they're around, they're after, looking what you need, monitoring the machines, until you get better. And that's your state when you come out of a possible sin that you almost committed. I respect your weakness. You're like that person in the ICU. You need people around you. You need the nurse. You need the righteous people around you. You need an environment of goodness. You cannot just think, Allah, Allah, come back. Then it most definitely shaitan will come once again. Now, and I give you some good news. When you walk away from the sight of sinning, you almost sinned, but you walked away. Do you think you walk away empty-handed? Wallahi la. Wallah, number one, you walk away having fulfilled an obligation. And that is to keep away from a sin. And that, we said, is better than many voluntary deeds. You walk away with refreshed and renewed iman. Right? Your iman just increased. And that is how a person can increase and refresh his iman. You walked away with genuine fear of Allah. But someone really, you genuinely fear Allah. Alhamdulillah, thank Allah for the ni'mah that he's given you. And you walk away with a, with a complete good deed. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Man hamma bisayyatin, falam ya'malha kutibat lahu hasanatan kamilah. Whoever desired to commit a sin, and he ended up not doing it, Allah would grant him one full hasana. MashaAllah. That's the second way. Shyness of Allah. All of this discussion was about being shy of Allah. You can only be shy of Allah if you remember Allah at the second you are committing the sin. Number three. A third way in how a person can avoid the sin is to contemplate Allah Azzawajal's favors upon you and his kindness upon you. And to know that sins most definitely remove blessings and this is inevitable. My brothers and sisters in Islam, Allah Azzawajal has blessed us immeasurably his blessings upon us are immeasurable how many has he given can you count Allah no one can count Allah promised on top of this if you continue to remain grateful for Allah he will continue to increase you in blessings and not a single person that commits a sin except that Allah removes a blessing from him due to that sin if you repent, Allah returns this blessing for you. Or he replaces it with something similar. But if a person persists upon the sin, the blessing does not return. If a person continues to sin, blessings are removed one after the other. 
until the blessings are completely gone. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, "Inna Allah la yughayyiru ma biqoum hatta yughayyiru ma bi anfusihim." You've probably heard the ayah a hundred times, and a hundred times you heard it, you heard it with the incorrect understanding. How do people translate the ayah? Allah will not change a people until they change what's in themselves. Allah. That's not the primary understanding of the ayah. The ayah means, as Allah Azza wa Jal said in Surah Al-Anfal, ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّ اللَّهَ لَمْ يَكُمْ مُغَيِّرًا نِعْمَةً أَنْعَامَهَا عَلَىٰ قَوْمْ حَتَّى يُغَيِّرُوا مَا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ What it means is that Allah Azza wa Jal will not change the condition of a people. Meaning, He will not change their good condition into a bad condition until they themselves go from obedience to disobedience. That's what the ayah means. Even the ayah is saying that Allah Azza wa Jal has blessed you. He's given you blessings and a good state, health and wealth and whatever it is of the provisions. He does not change this. He continues to give it and provide more and more and increase it so long as you are grateful. But when you change from gratitude to ingratitude, from obedience to disobedience, then it is only expected that the blessings and the good state will go from good to bad. You make a tawba istighfar, Allah Azza wa Jal would replace and return the blessed state and good state that you are in. Now, so sins, they don't only take away worldly blessings. That would have been يعني, half an issue. But the problem is that sins also eat up on spiritual blessings. And that's very dangerous. The greatest blessing that Allah Azza wa Jal has given us is Iman and our belief in Allah Azza wa Jal. And the sins, fornication, stealing, intoxication, riba, gambling, backbiting, cheating, they rob faith and they remove Iman until a person is left with no Iman. Some of the Salaf, they would say, I committed a sin and I was deprived of the night prayer for an entire year. See how it affected his Iman? You might find yourself, you can no longer attend the masjid and listen to an Islamic lecture and pray with the believers in jama'ah. Why? Maybe that's because of a sin. Allah deprived you of the goodness of al-masjid. Maybe, it could be. You might have some knowledge, memorize some Qur'an, you forgot it. It could be a sin. Knowledge is gone. These are all blessings. Some people came to some of the Salaf and they said, we used to pray the nights and we're not able to pray anymore. He immediately answered and he said, ذنوبكم, Your sins have shackled you and held you back. Others would say, I committed a sin and I was deprived from understanding parts of the Quran. That's what happens. Ultimately, Adam السلام, was removed from the blessing of the paradise because of a sin he committed. Didn't that happen? So concerning this, if you have a blessing and you would like to retain it and protect it, then keep away from the sin. That's what the third point is teaching us. Look at your blessings. You want them? You want Allah Azza wa Jal to safeguard them for you? To preserve them? To multiply them? To increase them? Then keep away from sins. You don't want them? Sin. It's up to you. Yani in summary, Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah says, sins are fire that consume blessings just as a fire consumes firewood. And then he said, we seek refuge in Allah from losing the favors he has bestowed upon us or our safety and security be changed to other things.